You will never meet a mom more eager to homeschool than a mom of a three-year-old. Well, hey, and welcome back to The Commonplace. My name is Autumn, and I am here to make a video about kindergarten, except I'm gonna call it Kinderleben because that is the word I am now used to using. Um, I first came across the word in my curriculum, which is the CMEC. And I love them. And I then did some research into it. Like, is this a Mason word? Does this exist somewhere in the volumes? And I really couldn't find it. But I did find a professor maybe from Covenant or somewhere like some some guy somewhere who kind of coined it after learning about Mason and learning about this approach for education with a child. And so I am going to say Kinderleben. If you're like, what is that word? That's kind of the backstory. But ultimately what I'm talking about is planning a kindergarten year. And I'm gonna turn it on its head as I like to do because guess what mother, you are the best kindergarten. So I am not talking about planning a year of flashcards and worksheets and sitting at a table and reviewing materials and even narrating or all sorts of things that you think about with the Charlotte Mason idea of education. Kindergarten is not like what you envision at school. It's not what I'm gonna tell you to plan. It's not what I want you to plan. I do not think you need to go and buy a curriculum at all. So this is really a video that I initially thought of for Common House because we are doing a whole summer series planning. If you are trying to plan, I know the school year's coming up and you have questions about timetables and log books and how to write a form lesson, a common subjects lesson. How do you make an at a glance weekly term overview guide? How do you organize your notebooks and how do you really plan well? Well, guess what? There's a whole series in Common House that pairs so nicely with our How to Begin, a classical Charlotte Mason co-op. I've just got a lot of courses going on in there. I like to teach and equip women. That's what I like to do. And so we have a lot of a lot of things in there, lots of templates, lots of lessons, lots of self-paced classes that you can take. And so consider joining us over there. But this is a video that was originally intended for them. And then I thought, let's extend it because I love fighting back against the modern idea of kindergarten and preschool. And we will just give Comet House the special perk of my term one kinderleben plans for our co-op because we did start a co-op, a classical Charlotte Mason co-op in our area this year. I'm very excited about it and I expected to have a lot of youngsters running around. And like I said at the beginning, no one is more eager to homeschool than a mom of a youngster, someone who's three or four, right? They are the most eager to get started and they want to know what they can buy and what they can do in ordering their home and setting up their habits and their rhythms and everything. And that's great. It's because you love your kids, but there is an actual design to how children and learn in a developmental stage created by God. And we have to put those things together to do things really well. And I think that's ultimately what a mom wants to know. And so when it came to our co-op, I knew we'd have a lot of little guys running around and I didn't want to stick them in a daycare type setting. And I didn't want to put them in a kindergarten type setting. And so we created a, a Kinderleben and a Babyleben room that involved things like poetry and snack, fairy tales and art, um, play, lots of free play, different things like that. And then of course, enjoying the recitations of our older students, which are a gift to the whole co-op when they come and recite for us. And so we created that and I really love it. It's very simple. The, the term one plans, it's not a whole built out 18 page guide, like a lot of the stuff that I make. It's just a simple list of here's what we'll be reading. Here's the poetry we'll be reading. Um, here are some considerations when you're in the room, how to help the students. It's going to be given to Common House. If you want it, come on over you can have it. So I already have two resources for more on this. I will be linking them above. One is the podcast about the five and under crowd it's from about two years ago. So it's a little bit older, but it's still going to apply. And then Charlotte Mason in the early years, which is a YouTube video from last year. So I'm going to leave those there because those kind of explore the idea of atmosphere and habits or atmosphere and discipline. We have three instruments in Mason education to rightly motivate and teach a child. One is atmosphere. One is discipline or habits and one is uh, life or ideas. And today I'm just going to focus on the actual ideas. I think build out a really lovely kindergarten year, if you will. So I joke that my kids are in Kinderleben from the time they're born until they start formal school because I started learning about classical education and eventually Mason when I was pregnant with my oldest. So seven over seven years ago. And uh, we have just been ordering our life as I've learned around these ideas. So you're born into my family and you are in Charlotte Mason kindergarten because that is just how we do life. And that is kind of the first point here. You are teaching your child, even from the ages of two, three, four, five, how to move in God's world as a person, as a person with limitations, as a person with needs, as a person with longings. And that starts even when they're this young. And so you do need to feed the mind of a young child with living ideas 
from the moment they are born until the moment they leave you and are making all the decisions on their ideas on their own about what they're bringing in, you need to give them what they're actually made to receive. And so today I'm going to run through some of my favorite categories of ideas with book suggestions and different things for you to bring into your home for this kindergarten year. And I think what you'll find is you're laying down a foundation that yes, will serve you when you start those formal lessons, but will actually put you on the path of just living life in a humanizing way. And that is the point. Okay, so Mother's Thinking Love. I do have a guide about this in Common House um, with all sorts of questions and ways I decide what I do with my children and when. Because just like when you feed a child the right food and the right amount, the right time, you have to do the same thing with what you give them for their minds. And there are certain things you can do that allow them to embody living ideas in really unique, beautiful ways that kids love. Things like poetry, things like being out of doors, nature study, songs, stories, handicrafts, all sorts of things that you can, you can fill the life of a child with, giving them that path forward. And ultimately what you're trying to do is allow them to make relationships between things. The science of relations is the hallmark of an education, a Charlotte Mason education. And what you're trying to help them do is connect knowledge to God, knowledge to knowledge, and knowledge to man. And they will do that on their own. Their mind was made to make these ideas. You're not having to piece it together for them, but you do have to give them the ideas and then their minds will get to work feeding on them as they're supposed to. So the first category I want to do is like all the outside stuff because little kids should be outside a lot. Yes, you've probably heard that Charlotte Mason says six hours a day. Well, she said six hours a day when the weather is great. Well, not great. When the weather is good. Um, there's not going to be necessarily, and depending on where you live, um, the ability to be outside for six hours a day every day of the year. I know there's that phrase like there is no bad weather, just bad clothing. That's not totally true in my opinion, but um, even on those really difficult weather days, Mason aims for an hour in the morning, the hour afternoon. The, the point being your kids need to be out of doors. Out of doors is good for us. We are creatures made for creation. It is very good for us to be out of doors. Um, it's good for our souls, it's good for our bodies, it's good for our minds. We need to get outside. And so let's cover all the outside ideas that you can do with your young children this year. And you can really, I mean, you, if you're like me, you'll make a little binder and a little spreadsheet to keep yourself on track because there's so many exciting new things you wanna do. But you also can just make this the pattern of your life and you don't need to write it all down, it's okay. So two games that Mason loves to play outside is sightseeing and picture making. And the way you play this is pretty simple. Now you could have really young kids, I've heard this from some common house members where they don't really get the game, they don't wanna play they don't understand and that's fine each child's gonna come into this at their own age I find that uh, my younger kids so like my boys tend to just fall into these things a lot earlier because they're used to doing them because my oldest is doing them and so that seems to be helpful the younger the younger siblings just grow up very masony they don't even know that there's another way to live where the oldest is the one that's always kind of learning the habit first for the rest of them so keep that in mind but what you do is you have two games you can play so the first that you send your child off to go look at something you send them down the trail ahead of you you say, go take note of what you see, come back and tell me. It could be that they're studying a house in the distance, they could be looking at the end of a trail, the part of a creek, different things. And when they come back, they're narrating it to you. They're telling you what they observed, what they saw. And you can ask these little questions like, well, what, what side of the house was the tree on? What color was the roof? Did you see any birds? How many holes were on the trail? And these are gonna be things the kids are like, oh, I don't know. I'm gonna go see. And they run off and they go check and they come back. And so you're training them in this habit of attention and observation because guess what? You cannot move in God's world without either. You cannot learn anything without either. You cannot even pray if you can't attend. So this is a very important thing to cultivate in a child and help them train. The other is to sit together, study a beautiful area, close your eyes, and then tell each other what is in the painting that you've made, the picture that you've made. And these are just really lighthearted, fun ways to start working on certain habits. And the goal isn't even to work on the habits. Like I wanna be clear about this. You can turn this into a very utilitarian thing, which makes it a servile thing. It's, it becomes a skill. It becomes something that's not supposed to be necessarily. Doing the observing is actually the thing you're supposed to be doing. It's the gift within itself, right? Like it's good in and of itself. You don't need to get something necessarily. And yet at the same time, there's only certain type of soil from which things like attention and observation can grow. So you are both putting them in the position in which they can learn these things, but you're giving them a gift that's just good enough by itself. To go and study nature, to put those pictures in your mind and your soul for solace then and in the future is a tremendous gift. Poets are really good about talking about this. They will remember the natural scenes they have stored in their mind 
years down the road and then of course talk about what an aid it is to them how it refreshes them how it restores them so this is really a gift in and of itself and also it trains certain things that do need to be taught in your child like attention and observation it's both but i don't want it to fall into the utilitarian category where you think you're like okay observe harder we have to get this this is the thing it's not it's the gift itself you can also do things like pressing flowers together you don't need to go buy anything to do this you can use an old book anything that's heavy like that just put wax paper on either side of your flower so that you don't ruin your book and you don't ruin the flower but you don't ruin the book um you can just do that together you can then go and draw pictures of your flowers in your nature journals you know give them a box of crayons if they're little um give them some watercolors a little bit older and they want to play with that and just enjoy studying the color of a thing recording what you've seen tell them the name of a thing mason seems to think that all of us know all of our birds our flowers our butterflies our trees I did not know all these things. I'm learning them with my children, but many moms do know these things. And so when you're walking on the trail and you point out, oh, this is a geranium. Oh, this is a rose. This is a sunflower. You show them these things um, and then you give them names and you're already teaching them about God's world. And why do we learn about God's world? I asked this of my, my daughter before we start formal lessons every day, and she will say to know his love. That is what we're doing here. So by pressing flowers, by doing a habitat, you could get caterpillars and have a butterfly habitat. You could watch worms, you could have ants, all sorts of things. You give them these little parts of God's world to study and to love, and they will begin to care rightly about God's world. All stuff you can do out of doors with them. Really fun, do it with them, get involved. Do not take a lot of time. Do not need to necessarily buy things. Um, it's just learning how to move in God's world really well when you're really young. And also when you're in your thirties like me, and you're also still learning these things because you were not educated this way. Then of course we can start bringing the nature in. So if you have had any sort of garden plot over the summer, you are harvesting things. Now you bring those in, you cook with them, uh, let your kids bring in flowers and make bouquets. My kids love making little bouquets to put around the house. Um, they're often cutting things. My husband wish they wouldn't cut from the garden, but you know what? They're learning how to make things beautiful and they are doing it in a way that they can and it's meaningful it's not just you know empty silly kids work that parents kind of shove kids off to do so they can get the real work done no they're actually doing the real work that brings beauty and joy to the family you can also work on uh, geography with a sand tray so it doesn't need to be anything crazy formal again um, kids naturally I think like the sand tray they're excited about it so you can work on making mountains or making valleys or making peninsulas or straits um you can do did i say islands islands my kids love to make islands and so you can just have them make the things they've seen if you're able to see one of these things easily out in nature then have them come home and build it with their um with their sand tray have them make an area you know can you build our favorite spot down by the creek or can you build our favorite spot where we go skiing whatever it is and you can you can actually have them one remember and then to create and imitate what they've seen which is really important and they just love the sand and i recommend kinetic sand when it falls it doesn't spread everywhere you can kind of just shove it together and it regroups and you just pick it up and put it back in so that's a good way to do that as well now another thing is play i want to say this when you're bringing your outdoor in and you're still out of doors a lot so if your kids are maybe like that five age like i have a very engineering mind little boy my middle guy he's very smart he's very quick the relation of places is very easy for him so he'll be doing a lot of compass work this year and i know he's going to love it. It's part of our scouting. All of my kids are in our scout group, which is called Withy Wendell. If you can get the reference, points to you. And um, it's going to be amazing. I'm not the scout leader, so I can brag about how amazing it's going to be because she's done great work. But um, we are going to be doing a lot of compass work. And so one thing that I did last year was using play to embody ideas of virtue and ideals of virtue. And we declared war on another family, actually our other scout family. And we spent all week doing all sorts of things that would count as school. I actually talk about this in depth in Common House, but we hand we hand sewed a flag, so we were doing handicrafts. We drew out a map of the area that we would be having our war in on a trail, so we were doing map work. We planned different sort of military routes. We, um, we read story, we talked about characters, we named things, and all of this was really important, but it was also doing a lot of outdoor work like we were doing geography and we were doing compass work and we were doing planning and signaling and flags it was a lot of stuff like that that felt like play to my kids and if you know about scouting it should be like play um and it was really fun i had a great time i mean if you want to know what school is like you're outside in the woods on a friday morning in your wedding dress with war paint on and a bow and arrow running around trying to capture a flag like that's pretty awesome yes that was me i had a pretty good time my husband jokes that i'm homeschooling the kids just to homeschool myself but you know what it's not a bad way to do things and the kids loved it and they did a tremendous amount of what would be considered school work but it's just how they live it's just what they think you do with your best friends on a friday morning and you spend the whole week with your mom 
being Betsy Ross. So it's a really, it's a really good way to bring outdoor in, make it into play, something like a war or an adventure, something about playing your favorite storylines out, things like that. You can really show kids one, how to play, how to engage in story, but two, it requires certain crafts and skills and handiwork to be able to play to that degree. And you have the ability to do that. So then we come inside to the bookshelves, okay? I'm gonna give you a couple of categories that you should regularly be reading to your young children. Now, if you've read Home Education and you know that Mason said, don't read to a child too much, what she meant is don't read to a child about the things that you could just go show them. Um, if you live near the ocean, don't read books about going to the ocean and looking at crabs, go look at crabs. But you should also be reading really good stuff to your young children. And she does mean a couple of categories. She means Bible, she means myth, she means fairy tale. So I'm gonna give you a couple of options. The Bible is the easiest one, read it straight up. It's fine if you like a storybook Bible, but that's not the Bible, it's a storybook. Um, read the Bible to children. Doesn't mean you need to <laughs> share with them like the hardest parts of the Bible, the scariest, darkest stories or anything, but just read it to them. It's made for them. They're image bearers and this is God's gift to them. So just read the Bible to them straight up. You should be doing that in your lessons as well. Um, and that's a really easy one to do as a family. Make it really lovely. Let the kids move around a little bit if they need to. Um, that's a rule that we have at our house that's helpful if you're doing morning prayer or anything is that your feet can be moving quietly, but your mouth must be quiet. We're still working on the mouth must be quiet, I'll be honest, but it is a good rule. So just so you don't think kids are sitting there like this little kids while you read the Bible, it's probably not gonna happen. For fairy tales, um, really easy is to look for Andrew Lang's fairy tale books, the color fairy tale books. So he has the blue fairy book, the yellow fairy book, the lavender fairy book, the red fairy book, he has a lot of colors. And they are collections of fairy tales. Um, and so you get a little bit of Grimm's, a little bit of Anderson, you get a whole collection and my kids love the fairy books. So consider picking up one of those as well. Um, if you want to give some books to me, there is a set of first editions. They're like $17,000 on Etsy, but I would accept it from you, thanks. For myths, um, there is the uh, the Greek myth book by the Delaires, might be how you say their last name. I really don't know how to say anyone's names because I read alone at home, um, but they're great. I also think Norse myths are very interesting. There are a lot of connections to C.S. Lewis's work if he loved the Norse myths. Actually, I have to tell you guys this thing. So um, I have my video about how you should read the Chronicles of Narnia. And in them, you'll see my husband's paperback version. And I got a little tired of my husband always saying that my favorite books in the whole house, right? We have well over like 1200 books in this house, but my favorite seven books are his Chronicles of Narnia books. So I bought my own set. I got some old ones and they're hardback and they're lovely. And by old, I mean like the 50s, right? Because Lewis was writing them in the 50s, but still, um, they're lovely. They are the first edition of the US print though. So I'm reading them and all of a sudden, you know, the Pevensies go to the Fawn's house, Tumnus is gone, and they're reading the note that should be signed by Maugrim. And they are signed, the book, the, the note is signed by a wolf named Fenris Ulf. I'm like, what? What is Fenris Ulf? So I go flying through the book to get to the middle when Peter slays the wolf and he is named Peter Wolfsbane by Aslan because he is the bane of the wolf, right? No, no, it's Fenris Bane. It's this Fenris Ulf guy. I'm freaking out. What books did I just buy? These are not Narnia. No, they are. So apparently Lewis decided to make some adjustments before the US print happened. And then in the early 90s, the printers decided to keep with the original British prints for everyone. So that's why my husband's edition says Maugram and why like the UK edition say Maugram. But I have this book with Fenris Ulf. And so I'm doing like deep into the Google dives because Lewis loved a good literary trick. He loved secrets and hiding things in work. So people think that maybe it was the influence of Tolkien who did not really like the Chronicles of Narnia. He thought it was too mishmashy. I'll include a very funny video from a comedian about their conversation about it. It is hilarious watch it. Um, but they, maybe this is what Lewis wanted to do all the time. And he was like, no, no Norse mythology, because there are these references that have been changed, but they're in my book and all of them are Norse myth references. And uh, Tolkien was like, just take them out. It's too much. It's too much. So then Lewis like snuck them back in maybe because he knew Tolkien wouldn't read the American books. We don't know. We don't know, but my books have them. And it was blowing my mind is all I could talk about for days. And Fenris Ulf was this Norse myth wolf that symbolized death. He was like the living dead crazy. But you have to know these things in order to understand the great conversation that is happening in books. If you don't get the references, you miss quite a bit. So you should read your children myths. Okay, poetry. Pick a poet. Just pick a poet. Uh, Christina Rossetti, we did her last year. It was great. Read a lot of her. Um, I am doing some Gerard Manley Hopkins with my children this year. This is not part of my curriculum. I'm just adding it in because he's my favorite poet and I want my children to see the world the way he saw the world. So I'm going to give them a lot of poetry to store up in their minds. Um, a, a book like Favorite Poems Old and New is really 
really great. Pulls from a lot of different places. We found some of our favorite poems that way. Um, just read them poetry, lovely poetry. Winnie the Pooh, like A. A. Milne is poetry. Read that to them. Um, give them, poetry is the, what is it Mason says? Like the highest of the literary form or the highest of the languages or something like that. Um, it's beautiful. And I have found, I will tell you that I have found my children spontaneously <laughs> recite poetry they know at appropriate times because something clicks for them and they have the language to express it. I have actually heard my five-year-old quote Shakespeare from A Midsummer Night's Dream um, because we go to very beautiful nature places and so it just sparked. I've heard my four-year-old recite Wendell Berry. These are children who are very common. They sometimes pick their nose, they call each other names, <laughs> they run away from me when I call them sometimes. They're also magnificent and lovely. They are very common, right? But I have just been like jaw dropped, like, well, yeah, I know I taught you that poem. Like, I know we've enjoyed that together, but the fact that you just said it while we were out in the woods, oh my goodness, this is working, it's happening. And there you go. You need to read your kids' poetry as well. Now, I do want to say, note on memory in the early years, I do not want anyone like making their kids chant and sing things that their children have no relationships with because I just think it's a travesty when that happens. Um, memory should happen in the early years without any labor. So Mason, her way of doing it is that you read it to the child. You don't let them try and recite it with you until they actually fully know it. But you read the whole thing and then you read maybe a couple lines of it, Bible verses too, um, Bible passages as well. You read a couple lines and then you just read them again, but at odd times. So the child doesn't just hear them at the same time in the same way every day. You might be in the car on the way somewhere, walking down the trail, waiting in line at the grocery store, at home, cooking dinner, and it helps them kind of cement it in these different times, but it's learnt with, without labor. So it's not difficult for the child is the number one thing. So do not be like, I say this, you say it back to me, say it again, say it again, say it again. Don't do that to them. You'll destroy their love of anything. And the last thing would be nature lore, history, and classic novels, I would say, for filling the literary life of your child. So for nature lore, we love the James Harriet Treasury right now. Um, I think that's a great one. The stories are really lovely. Also, if you want to watch the show, you and your husband, I think it's pretty cool too. And then for history, picking from Holling C. Holling or from James Baldwin's 50 Famous Stories Retold, those are great. All of my kids have enjoyed those, no matter their age, and they've acted them out, they've played them, they've loved them. And it's important that, child, that a child knows about other times and places, that in fact, the men of his time may not be the me best men who have ever lived. And if he learns that, he'll be better for it, Mason says in a rather snarky moment in one of her volumes. So then with classic novels, if you go to any book Charlotte Mason site, AO, uh, Read Aloud Revival, Simply Charlotte Mason, you'll find a whole list of books. Everyone pretty much agrees on the same ones, like Frog and Toad, um, Brambley Hedge, Winnie the Pooh, Robert McCloskey, like all of those sorts of books. Um, read those to them. Read them and enjoy them. Do not ask for narrations before they are in formal lessons. Do not ask for narrations. This is not school. I repeat, this is just a way of life and you are just filling them with the best ideas for their age, for how much they can digest and for how much they can um, really enjoy at this at this point and be formed by. And then you can move over to occupations and you should use, um, this is like work for the child. So you should use really simple materials. You should engage them with certain art things. They can do chalk, they can do painting, they could do a little bit of drawing. You don't wanna over fatigue them of course and you don't wanna overwhelm them and you don't wanna be you know critical of what they're doing, but you do want to give them materials to start making things. So this could be handicrafting. You could do a knitting fork. You could do simple embroidery stitches. You could do paper sloyd. You can teach them folk dances, uh, very simple drill, Swedish drill type things. My little guys get involved in all this stuff during my formal daughter's lessons. It does not matter. They will definitely be at the table to work on whatever she is working on. And they do it with gusto and intention and they really are applying themselves. And so if you are looking for little things to do like that, maybe go through a handicraft um, area of Simply Charlotte Mason or again, AO, or if you have access to something like the CMEC because you have an older student, they have a whole section on Kinderleben, um, all sorts of handicrafts. You can do like paper folding, paper modeling. Paper modeling seems to be a really great one that my kids really love and they will then use in their play all the time, like making envelopes and playing Postman, stuff like that. But it should feel like it is freedom in your kinderleben. All of this stuff should not feel like there's a timetable. You may have a timetable for yourself, a general pattern and rhythm to your day. So you make sure you're getting to the things you wanna to get to because it is true that when you're in the season of this guy, this guy needs a nap and this guy needs a snack and oh my goodness, I have to change this guy again. Um, it can feel like the day is just kind of like flying by and you're like, what did we do today? And you do wanna make sure you have these anchoring pegs of things you are giving your children so that it's not just an empty day. But at the same time, know that those things are really good for a child. An ordinary home atmosphere is incredibly healthy for 
well, children of all ages, but particularly young children, it's enough. They don't need preschool, they don't need kindergarten. Um, but you can also be very mindful that mother's thinking love of the ideas you are bringing in in the season of life and making it really lovely. So we talk about this kind of stuff in Common House. I know I'm always talking about it, but if you don't know, it's like a Patreon, but better. It's where I teach more in depth. It's where sometimes we get more practical, but I am breaking down the philosophy because that is the tool you need, the, the magic key, if you will, to unlocking this classical wardrobe so that you can then live in these life-giving ways with your children in tow and it just becomes the way of doing things living as god intended rather than um, a list of to-dos or more you have to struggle against or more on your plate and so we'd love to have you if you have any questions let me know down below i hope you have a very merry kinderly of year and i will be back soon to talk about three ideal types in classical literature that i think are uniquely wonderful for women because they are women and they show virtue in a feminine way and i can't wait to share them with you i'll see you soon